nuts. Uh, hey, Toki, look inside of your basket. Guess what? You are in such a crappy mood. You have ladies' tampons on side of it. And you buy them for yourself. Go have a conversation with all the ladies and tell them your problem. You lady squish car. No, it's not. Two cups of rice. Brutal. You know, I've been thinking. I remember being 14 and staying up late watching Adult Swim. Some of my worst memories are from that time, but there was always something really good to watch on television. Metalocalypse, one such television show, ran on Adult Swim from 2006 until it was unfortunately cancelled in 2013. A tongue-in-cheek parody of the death metal scene while also a celebration of its larger-than-life attitude, Metalocalypse is a show about a rock band. But not just any rock band, the largest rock band the world has ever seen. The five-man group known as Death Clock are such a larger-than-life parody of fame that in-universe they alone are one of the largest economic powerhouses. In this universe, if Death Clock isn't creating music, the world stops turning. Suicide rates skyrocket, small countries engulf in civil war, and the world's underground secret Illuminati scramble to fix the issue. Your typical episode of Metalocalypse goes like this. The episode opens with the band sitting around in their obtusely large dragon-shaped home, Mord House, and then one of the members of the band proclaims a change in their lifestyle. We get a quick bit of exposition from the rest of the band members and their reactions before we shift over to the secret Illuminati headquarters. The group known only as the Tribunal are dedicated solely to monitoring Death Clock's activities. More often than not, some action the Death Clock has taken threatens to upset the status quo. The Tribunal is then briefed every episode by some crazy specialist that sounds like something out of a fever dream. Things like celebrity depression expert or celebrity relationship and marriage expert. Each one of these is introduced by Senator Stampingston, who is voiced by Mark Hamill, and I swear that each of these names was just the writer's attempt to trip up Hamill in the vocal booth. Names like Dr. Crumpsworth Shaplingala. Uh, hold on. Dr. Crumpsworth Shaplingalacia the fourth junior. Dr. Tormundbind McMillden, Dr. Richard Reinhold, I don't even know how to pronounce this one, and Dr. Commander Vermin Chunt Spinkton, many of which were voiced by real life rock and roll celebrities. From here, we get an explanation of how the in universe world will react to the newest exploits of the band or band member, and then a decision is made by Mr. Salacial the group leader, of how they will, or if they will at all, interact to stop the band's decision. This sounds like a lot of setup, I know, but it's usually only about two minutes of each episode. The rest of the episode centers around the band members doing whatever it is that that episode is about and watching the world react. For instance, in the episode called Death Gov, the governor of Florida refuses to establish a holiday for Death Clock singer Nathan Explosion, and then is lynched on the spot. The episode then centers around the plot of Nathan Explosion being elected as a write-in governor, and then through rampant acts of nepotism, electing the other band members to very dangerous or sometimes downright fictitious positions. Needless to say, Governor Explosion, knowing nothing about basic algebra, much less governmental leadership, proceeds to run the state into absolute anarchy. The episode ends with somebody declaring that he was the best governor that Florida ever had. This should be a good enough point as any to go over the humor of the show. Most of it is based around the macabre. Death, gore, and absurd stupidity cover most of the show in a thick blanket. The real comedy that the show relies on for the most part is the idiocy of the band members. This ignorance is usually completely inherent or just inherited from their life as what are effectively pampered rock star babies. Several episodes focus completely around the band's complete detachment from reality and how they can't function in normal day-to-day -day life, each with their own characteristics and reasonings behind the fact. Take example, the first episode in which the band accidentally kills their chef in a rock concert accident. They keep him alive and hooked up to several machines and then panic about how they no longer are going to get food and will starve to death. The rest of the episode then focuses around the band trying to operate in normal society to the point of being able to feed themselves. They attempt several endeavors, all of which end in failure. One of these is an attempt at buying food from what they call a food library. Food libraries. Food, food, food libraries. It's called Lib a grocery store, you douchebags. I'm sorry about douchebags. I got, got low blood sugar. Under the stipulation to not buy booze. All right, here's the deal. We have to do our own shopping so we can make our own dinner like our regular jackoffs do. Now you're all in charge of putting together one dish. And don't just buy booze. That ain't food. What do you mean booze ain't food? 
I'd rather chop off my ding dong than admit that. You'd rather chop off your ding dong than not drink? Yeah! Wow, we. This is what I love about this show. It's absolutely larger than life setting, allows for some ridiculously absurdist comedy. But that's not all that the show has to offer. On top of everything else, the show sports a fantastic soundtrack that has been playing throughout most of this video. I remember being 16 and playing some of these tracks in my car on the way to school. If you're a fan of melodic death metal, then you're likely to enjoy it as well. Most of the songs are used in universe too. One of the more famous tracks is a one minute coffee jingle that people in universe travel across the globe to come see live in Arctic Norway. Here, I'll show you a clip. As I'm sure you can see from the clip, audio was obviously their main focus when designing the show. I don't really have any defense for the show's animation style though. It's rather abrasive with its transitions and honestly feels more than a little lackluster when you compare it to other animated works. Characters changing positions or changing the way that they're facing or walking can feel really messy and disjointed. But for what the show aims to do, I suppose the animation is passable. Even if audio was their main focus, there is something that stands out really harshly in comparison to the rest of the mixing, the characters' voices. During season one of Metalocalypse, most of the main characters were voiced by series creator Brandon Small. One character's voice in particular was produced by sticking cotton balls in Small's mouth. There is a huge problem with season one's voices. They are just too difficult to understand. Ironically, it kind of fits the death metal theme of the show in a way, though. Just as it takes a trained ear to understand the low-pitched growls of a death metal vocalist, it also takes a trained ear to kind of understand what any of the characters are saying in Season 1. There's one scene in particular from Episode 1 that stands out in my memory regarding this. Here, I'll, I'll share it with you. See what I mean? I don't know how this got past editing, to be honest. Though the show has its ups and downs, Brandon Small and team ended up presenting us with a pretty interesting end product. I tend to rewatch it about once every two years, and I'm always surprised to remember that it was cancelled right before its conclusion. Rip in peace, Metalocalypse. 8 out of 10. Very good. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and also remember to share it with anyone that you think might enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching. The next video will probably be after Halloween. Rock on.